I'm Reverend Rachel Brown, the pastor here at Hamburg Presbyterian Church on this June 7th, 2020. This morning's scripture is the Great Commission, the instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples, his apostles, and all of us to tell the good news of who he is, was, and ever shall be. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation this morning. Join me, Matthew 28, verses 16 through 24. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you to the ends of the earth. You see, Jesus declares in this verse that all authority on heaven and on earth have been given to him he's proclaiming himself as the son of god he is saying this is not a secret to be hidden away or compartmentalized inside of ourselves but to be an exciting revelation of news good news of who jesus is and that good news transforms us and changes our lives. Now, how does Jesus do that? You see, the first is that we know that we are not meant to be alone. We are grown in our mother's belly. We are born not alone, but into this world with parents or later guardians or adoptive parents or step parents and we know that God desired for us to be in relationship with one another that God created us in God's image to be a reflection of his profound diversity and uniqueness that we are to cherish and value this diversity and uniqueness in equality. Not inequality, but in equality. Meaning to have equality. To understand that Jesus didn't just come for the Jewish people, for the Gentile people, but for all people, not just the people living in Israel at the time, but the people around the world. You see, Jesus was about uniting and unifying us. Jesus was about bringing people together from all walks of life. Jesus taught us that in the short time he was on this earth by being intentional about loving and building relationships with all people. You see, Jesus wanted us to understand the importance of that love. He was breaking down barriers. He was transforming lives. He was saying to men, women are no longer inferior. Women are equal. As he says in his scriptures, there is no longer Gentile or Jew, slave nor free, male or female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And why is that? Because we were made in the image of God, male and female. In Genesis, God talks about that. God created us in God's image. God wanted us to understand his great love for us. And so that commission, that great commission that Jesus gave 
to his disciples? Some of them doubted. They doubted who he was and they doubted what their role should be and they doubted what their voice was to give such claim to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, your voices are equal. That all my people are to share this message, this unifying message of love and peace and equality. You see, Jesus knew and understood what it meant to live in this world. Jesus understood what it meant to live through injustice. You see, we've had a hard last couple of weeks here in the United States and around the world, but I would say we've had a hard couple of months. We've had a hard couple of hundred years of injustice of one people group, one race, suppressing and oppressing another for their own benefit, either willingly and knowingly, or unwillingly and unknowingly. And Jesus, the Savior for us all, understood that and lived that. How does Jesus understand that? Because Jesus endured injustice. Let's look at how Jesus' friends sometimes treated him. You see, on that last night of his life, remember, he sat at the table to have a last meal. But before that, what did Jesus do? In ancient Roman times, it was customary that when guests came to a dinner table, the servants at the dinner would wash their feet before the meal. Jesus wanted to demonstrate his servant-like heart and attitude and show us that equality by washing his disciples' feet. Now, the message might have been lost on them, but the interesting thing is, is that it sure doesn't look like they were fighting Jesus to do it instead of him. They weren't lining up to wash each other's feet because they were still living in the stereotypes of who should do what in society. To them, a servant washed your feet. To Jesus, there are no more servants and slaves. There are no more hierarchy and lowerarchy but he wanted to teach us all that we are one in him. He showed us that in such subtle ways that sometimes we miss it and then we miss how to apply it in our own lives. Jesus wanted us to serve one another and he showed that to by washing his disciples' feet. You see, Jesus endured injustice so that we could understand that he was in solidarity with those who experience injustice, as we all do on various levels, but some significantly worse than others. Why? Why didn't his disciples grab that basin and wash each other's feet? In John 13, 2, it says the evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Judas has already decided to turn Jesus in, to give him over. Now, if you were Jesus knowing all this, the pride, the treachery, would you have been quick to wash their feet? You see, if you're guilty of something, if your subconscious feels like you've done something wrong, is it then easy for you to turn that into doing something right? No. We have to first look inside of ourselves for our own wrongdoing, for our own ways of sin and distrust and betrayal of how we feel toward another, and we have to leave them at Jesus' feet, leave our pride, 
our ego, perhaps even our blind spots about ourselves so that we can have true, authentic relationships with one another. You see, Jesus' closest friends mistreated him. And sometimes we mistreat our closest friends, our neighbors, sometimes without even realizing it. But God wants us to put our finger on those areas in our lives that need to be weeded out, transformed, reformed, and changed. Because that's who Jesus is, was, and ever shall be in our lives. Jesus wants us to be an authentic witness. And Jesus showed how to, us how to witness authentically. You see, that last day of Jesus' life, we watched as an innocent man began by being betrayed by his own friends, Judas Iscariot, turning him over. And then there was the judge, Caiaphas, who became the prosecutor and Caiaphas said in verse 63, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. In our day, if the answer is self-incriminating, you don't have to answer. But here, Jesus is being forced to incriminate himself by the judge. Can you imagine that happening in a courtroom today? The judge all of a sudden leaps up and says, hey, tell me whether you're guilty or not. You see, Jesus was put in that place of honesty and integrity that God desires us to be in at various moments of our life. We must become proactive about transforming our hearts and minds to be like Jesus, to act justly, to love kindly, to walk humbly with our God so that in any given moment we are not reactive to our sinful human nature, but we are proactive to live out Jesus commands. You see, to be Jesus's disciple, he calls us to self-examination. He calls us to read more, study more, learn more, grow more, to become the best versions of ourselves. You see, Jesus, right to the end, was betrayed, was called out as the Christ. Even Pontius Pilate, who knew and felt he was an innocent man, felt the pressure of the crowd to convict him. And often that's what happens in life. That even if we know the right thing in our heart, we feel the pressure of the crowd or society or our families or our communities and end up doing the wrong thing. Pilate made an attempt to appease Caiaphas and the mob by doing a couple of things, releasing a notorious criminal and offered them Bar Bar Barnabas. There was no comparison between his crimes and Jesus, so Pilate figured that they would free Jesus. But no, and Pilate has Jesus beaten to within an inch of his life, thinking it would satisfy the bloodthirsty mob. This was all done because Pilate was convinced that Jesus was innocent and so impressed with his composure. But finally, the religious leaders threaten Pilate's political standing by telling him they will tell Caesar if he doesn't acquiesce to their demands and crucify Jesus. 
So finally, Pilate rules against Jesus and the suffering of Jesus exceeded anything that we have ever undergone. He is mocked, beaten, whipped, a crown of thorns slammed into his head, and finally his suffering, including having his nails driven into his hands and feet. And through it all, somehow, Jesus kept his composure. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 says it best. Through all this disappointment, Jesus kept his composure. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. Open your Bibles with me, and I encourage you every week, to bring your Bible and a pen and paper, maybe take notes, perhaps even um, write down suggestions on things to read, go back and reread the scripture for the day. But first, Peter chapter 2, verse 23. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. If I continue reading, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd the guardian of your souls. We've experienced the painful agony and reminder of injustice in this world on the senseless death of George Floyd this last week, reminding us of the endless list of names that have gone before him throughout history, leading us to this moment, reminding us that Jesus himself suffered, but he suffered to teach us that there was to be suffering no more. That if we live as he taught us to live, to one another every minute of every hour of every day, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, that we can end injustice. If we follow Jesus, if we follow his example and how he lived his life through action, through our voices, through transforming our hearts and minds and souls, becoming the best version of ourselves who Christ intended us to be, we too can end injustice to people in this world. Let us look and be guided by Jesus in our thoughts, in our hearts, and in our actions. Let us be proactive, not just reactive. Proactive, extending the hand of grace and love. Proactive in being active in the change that needs to happen in our world. And let us follow Jesus and his example every step of the way. Amen.